background on what Contagion is, uh, a little bit of history of the project, where we are now, uh, where things are going. Um, so first of all, who's heard of Container D? It's been mentioned um, at least a couple times uh, so far uh, today if you've been in here. Um, so Container D showed up around the same time that the Open Container Initiative was formed. So the OCI uh, Run C has been mentioned here several times already this morning as well. Um, so Run C is that executor, the implementation of OCI's runtime spec. And so at the point that Docker uh, decided to, uh, to use Run C, Container D was created as a simple kind of management supervisor on top of the Run C uh, processes. Then later that year, uh, it was announced that, that Container D would expand to be more of a core, you know, full, fully functional container runtime that you could use separate from Docker. Um, and so that was announced late uh, December 2016. It would be called Container D 1.0. We differentiate that with the old Container D. Uh, we call that the 0.2 branch. Um, and then in March of last year, um, based on promises made at the announcement, that was contributed to the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the same uh, foundation under which Kubernetes and, and other cloud native projects uh, sit. And then by December, which is again just a, a little over a month ago, uh, we announced our full uh, version 1 release, and so that's out there uh, and available uh, to you. So that kind of gives you a, a quick flavor um, of where we've been. Uh, obviously, you can find out a lot more on our GitHub project page. Um, as we all know, STARS are the gold standard by which you decide if a project is worthy. Um, no, that's not that important. Uh, but we've got a, a broad base of contributors, and, um, and we've actually made a couple point releases since 1.0, and we'll talk through that. Um, so first of all, um, it might be helpful just to, to stop for a minute and say, you know, why Container D 1.0? Why, why was the initial little kind of supervisor for Run C uh, not sufficient? Uh, why did we need to create this larger kind of core container runtime? Um, well, it really continued that spin-out that began with OCI and Run C. Um, I don't know how many people used Docker three or four years ago when it was a single binary. You could plop it on a Linux system that was statically linked, and you had your image builder, you had the daemon, you had your client, all in one thing, uh, which was kind of nice from a usability standpoint, but not so nice for using Docker in different ways, and obviously as uh, Kubernetes showed up on the scene and other use cases. Uh, Docker as a monolithic uh, project was not really that valuable for the broader ecosystem. Um, so Container D was kind of the next step in that. So if you look at it kind of like a stack, you've got Run C as an executor of uh, the spec, the runtime spec. You've got Container D as this core runtime without uh, the sort of Docker uh, twist on, on how things are done, whether that's networking, volume management. So Container D provides that place uh, that if, if you're not interested in Docker's kind of ecosystem, uh, you can still have a core container runtime. So the things like Kubernetes through the CR, CRI can rely on Container D and not have to use the full Docker engine. And other cloud providers and other use cases uh, can use that. And then of course, you know, Combining that with donating the code outside of Docker uh, was valuable to get more of a broad collaboration uh, than just um, seeing it as another part of, of Docker's um, projects. Um, so Container D, uh, you know, you might uh, look at it and think, well, is this just a cut down Docker? Is it just a smaller version of, of the big Docker engine? Um, no, actually, in, in a lot of ways, it, it used the learnings of those first uh, two or three years of the Docker runtime to kind of rethink some of the things that were done, some of the things that weren't done as well as, as we would have liked to have seen. And so really, there's a set of technical goals that we would use gRPC uh, for the API, uh, that we would 
immediately start with everything being fully uh, based around OCI, so both the image spec and the runtime spec. Uh, the focus would be stability and performance, not so much new features and new releases, uh, and so have this well-defined core of base function. And then each part of container D would be fully decoupled, uh, so image, file system, runtime, and all uh, potentially be pluggable and reusable um, even without the rest of container D. And so uh, there's a basic architecture in 20 minutes. I obviously can't deep dive into all these areas. We're going to look at a couple that are maybe of interest. But effectively, each of these is a gRPC, gRPC service with an API. Uh, obviously, they all have you know, either metadata or storage. So uh, container metadata, image uh, references to, to blobs for your, your layers of your uh, container file system, snapshot drivers uh, mapped to what in Docker we call the graph driver, so you probably know about AOFS or overlay or device mapper. Those are snapshotters in the container D world. And obviously that links through a runtime where you can pass through an OCI spec and run a container via uh, run C. We also uh, developed a rich uh, Go library. So again, uh, container D is not necessarily uh, the best thing for replacing your use of, for example, the Docker client. Uh, but for embedding, it's actually very powerful. Um, feedback so far on the API is uh, you know, that it's highly usable, easy to use. I've given a few talks on it as well that you can find online about how quickly you can write a uh, you know, 60, 70, 80 line client that can pull images, start containers, uh, pause containers, remove containers, and tasks. Uh, so you can check that out. These slides will be online. You don't need to write these, uh, these down. So let's just talk through a few uh, pieces. Of, of the architecture. So snapshots I mentioned are similar to what Docker calls graph drivers, uh, how your root file system is translated uh, from a set of blobs into a running image. That's all handled within a snapshotter. Uh, to understand the simplicity of snapshotters, it might be useful to think about how Docker dealt with the graph driver that dealt with layers and mounts, uh, a layer store with the content addressability of how, how you assemble like an image called Ubuntu or Alpine. Um, and above that were, were, was a referenceable image store that had the mapping from names to images. Um, and the problem was not, not that you don't need these components, but that there were a lot of interconnections between these components that made it hard to write a new graph driver without making a lot of modifications uh, throughout Docker. So revisiting that when we uh, design container D was to have a much more simple snapshot or interface that the metadata uh, store would basically be this uh, intermediary between my set of layers, things I've downloaded from a registry, and my runtime that needs a, file, a root file system. And so uh, we can actually look at the snapshot or interface is very simple. Again, we don't have time to, to uh, deep dive into, into how that operates. But the nice thing about a snapshot is it just hands you the set of mounts. And so um, there's no more uh, deep inner linking between the graph driver all the way up to how a runtime sees, uh, sees that uh, assembly of layers. And so this makes it very simple to, to ask run C to run my container. I just handed a list of mounts that I got straight from the snapshot and run C can assemble those, mount them, and, uh, and I'm off and running. So again, a much smaller interface than graph drivers, more simple relationships, uh, and this external mount lifecycle that I just talked about, uh, which you can actually play with with our simple uh, CTR tool, which is the client for Container D. I can list snapshots, I can view them in tree form, and I can even tell it to hand me that set of mounts, and I can actually mount it you know, in Linux and start playing with my file system uh, directly uh, from a command line without actually running a container. Um, so those are, that's one valuable area where container D took the things we learned uh, from Docker and actually improved. Uh, running a container, again, I'll just hit this briefly. 
again, getting that list of mounts and the OCI configuration. So those are the two pieces of information I need, file system and config. Um, those services can hand that to any supported runtime. And so whether you use Run C, which is the default Linux uh, runtime, uh, Microsoft is working on their Windows containers on Windows and Linux containers on Windows uh, runtimes through their shim. Uh, obviously, you can replace Run C with uh, Hyper.sh or Intel Clear containers. And again, because of this, this uh, decoupled architecture, these pieces over here don't have to know about that runtime. Any OCI implementing runtime will be able to take that information and run your container in that, envir in that environment. Uh, I mentioned the API. I'm going to skip through these charts quickly um, so we don't uh, run out of time for kind of wrapping up. But the CTR tool obviously has simple commands like push, pull, run, start, create. Um, you can see on the right that same, um, same uh, actions in, in code form using the containerd go API client. So again, I connect to the daemon, I pull an image, um, I can then uh, run that image by creating a task and starting it. Again, you can do the same thing with the CTR command line tool. Um, kill a task, again, uh, obviously you get the picture that, that there's both a client operation uh, to do these and also a, a nice Go API for embedding these uh, capabilities within your own application. Um, there's also ways to customize the OCI configuration. So we've provided in the container D API a lot of with helpers. Uh, so this says with host namespace, so I want to start a container but I want to join the PID namespace of the host, for example, in this case. Um, so again, these with helpers, either you can use them as we provided them, or you can write your own to do things. Say, say you want to take container D and make a Docker-like full runtime. Obviously, you can create with helpers to do volume support, specialized networking. Uh, so again, this uh, ways to customize the OCI config. Uh, as you uh, process it through uh, your client. Um, I want to talk just briefly about releases. So I mentioned that our 1.0 release uh, came out in December at uh, KubeCon, Bob Con in Austin. Um, we spent a lot of time uh, defining a release process. That was one of the complaints about Docker, especially as it was used as the runtime underneath Kubernetes, about uh, breaking changes, moving too quickly. And so um, the key points of the release process, we are using Semver. Uh, major releases have a support horizon um, that includes backporting fixes until that support horizon is over. And so already since December, we've done two point releases and we've backported uh, many fixes out of master, which is leading toward our 1.1 release. And so again, we're very focused on support and bug fixes all the way through a support horizon, not forcing people to have to go to the next point release. Uh, the next point release does, uh, should include the Windows capabilities for container runtime support uh, that Microsoft is working on. And again, all the stability and back, backward compatibility guarantees uh, are provided for in the document, and it's, it's clearly stated so you know you know, the CTR tool versus the Go API versus the gRPC, you know, which things are supported for what time frame, and it looks like this if you, if you go to the document. Um, what's it look like as a project? Again, I, as I mentioned, we have a, a lot of uh, contributors, especially joining the CNCF. Other groups have gotten involved. Um, obviously, Docker is still uh, strongly involved uh, for their use case as part of the Docker engine stack. Um, it may be interesting to see that Tesla is the number four contributor. That's only because a Docker employee uh, left Docker, didn't join Tesla, and he's still very involved in the project. Uh, I don't think there's going to be any container D running in your Tesla vehicle uh, anytime soon. Um, but yeah, so as I mentioned, we're part of the CNCF. Uh, another interesting note is that uh, 
the Mobi project governance has changed. So I don't know uh, if anyone cares much about open source governance. Uh, there was a lot of uh, sort of a sticking point with Docker having a BDFL model codified in a lot of their projects. Uh, we changed that last year and now have the Mobi Technical Steering Committee that oversees all the Mobi projects, including Container D. Uh, I'm on that TSC as well as um, five other companies are represented on the TSC. And so uh, we're excited to see that there's definitely a growing number of contributors uh, to the project more than just a, a limited set of companies. Um, so obviously this is part of Docker stack. You've heard about CRI Container D in a few talks already in this room. Uh, there's been an experimental combination of Swarm Kit and Container D. So again, think of Docker and Docker Swarm mode as kind of the Docker Inc. official release. You could take Container D and Swarm Kit, which is an open source Mobi project, and basically create your own Swarm mode without any of kind of Docker Inc. products. Um, Linux Kit and Build Kit, we don't have time to go through those, but they're using Container D. Um, and then this week, just about four days ago, the Cloud Foundry runtime community um, proposed switching from Run C to Container D to get rid of some of the code that they've added uh, around the Garden uh, container runtime for Cloud Foundry. So we're excited to see them uh, use Container D. Uh, the Apache OpenWhisk uh, serverless project is using Docker today, but they're planning on switching to Container D. Uh, their folks at Puppet R&D who have been contributing to Container D, uh, and we hope to see that use case list growing in the future. Last couple slides, just to give a visual. Uh, Kubernetes today with the Docker shim. Uh, each one of these, each one of these steps in the stack means another G gRPC or API call layer. So as you can see, it's fairly deep today for Kubelet to go through the CRI Docker shim to the Docker engine, to Container D, to Run C. Um, the CRI Container D project is just merged into our, into our uh, GitHub code base, and we're planning to have them as a plugin. So this will be a single binary, Container D plus the CRI. So um, obviously, you can see a lot of hops will be reduced, and we've been spending a lot of time even uh, creating a lightweight gRPC protocol for the shim that saves memory and, uh, and definitely is much faster. Um, so we hope that this will uh, build a, definitely a, a better stack for Kubernetes use of the container D runtime for performance, memory use, et cetera, stability and everything else. Uh, if you go to Kelsey Hightower's Kubernetes the hard way, um, you can actually deploy today and try out CRI container D you can do it with Linux kit, you can type make all kube underscore runtime equals CRI container D and get a uh, uh, ISO with container D uh, Kubernetes 1.9 plus um, and, and try it out today. Um, so again, I've, I've talked through this, but, but kind of the takeaways, um, we hope that, that container D gets broad usage as a core container runtime for the Docker community, for Kubernetes, OpenWhisk, Cloud Foundry. We've been doing a ton of stress testing. Uh, we have a 24-7 stress uh, running with statistics and data uh, that uh, hopefully will we'll keep uh, Container D both with stability and compatibility guarantees, uh, like I talked about with our release process and bug fix backports. Um, so if you're interested, there's ways to contribute. There's uh, plenty of documentation out there, uh, there's room for more contributors, and uh, these slides are online in this bit.ly link, uh, FOSDEM 18 CTRD, and uh, I'd be happy to, if you have questions on Twitter, email me, uh, catch me on GitHub, and uh, I think we're out of time. Yeah, we are. Uh, yeah, but at the second. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, which means no questions, unfortunately, we need to switch, to switch to the next speaker. Uh, if anyone has questions, I'm sorry. Yep. Thank you.